All right. Well, good evening, everybody. We're glad to have you back uh, for our evening service. Or those of you who weren't here this morning, we're glad to have you here. And um, we're going to let's have a word of prayer as we begin our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the goodness and love that you've poured out on us. Um, I pray that uh, as we've heard your word this morning, I help us to put that into practice, to show the love to others that you've um, shown to us. Uh, we thank you for loving us when we were your enemies. Um, we thank you for the privilege it is to be a part of your church, uh, to be join heirs with Christ, to be able to come together and worship you. I pray that today, uh, as we worship you, you'll be honored and glorified, and our hearts will be ready for what you have for us from your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing uh, 476, three stanzas of it. It is glory just to walk with him. Let's stand as we sing, it is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. day. It is joy divine to feel him near whenever I path. Bless the Lord, it's glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps aright through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory when the shadows fall. He's near, oh, what joy to simply trust and pray. It is glory to abide in him when skies above are clear. Yes, with him it's glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps aright through the Never from his side again to stray. Twill be glory, wondrous glory with the Savior evermore, everlasting glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps aright through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with in order 440, I'll go where you want me to go. We'll sing three stanzas. 440, I'll go where you want me to go. Amen. 
my all unto thee, thy care. I know thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go Go ahead and be seated. All right, let me give you the many announcements we have. I don't think is this on, Phil? There we go. All right. It didn't sound on. Um, uh, don't forget, uh, there's still, oh, how many more days in the month? But there's enough that you can grab. There might be one, maybe two. Scripture uh, reading sheets on the back there that you can use to supplement your Bible study and prayer time. And uh, Sue does a great job each month giving us a theme to, to consider as we uh, read and study God's Word throughout the month. So if there's one left, you can grab one. I'm sure if you want one and there's none back there, Sue can at least send you a picture of it. Uh, she can at least get that over to you. And for the fat last, oh, 10 days or so, you can, you can follow along with us. Uh, this Wednesday is... The end of expeditions, and so as is the custom, we'll be having our awards ceremony, which is always a fun time uh, to uh, see and to um, hear all that the kids accomplished during the year, and so uh, we're thankful for, for that opportunity to see that, and then of course the kids love it because then they get to play a bunch of games afterwards, uh, so it's a good time for them to come out 7 o'clock on Wednesday to see all of that. Uh, next... I'm sorry, two Sundays, May 29th, we're having a potluck uh, that's still good to go. Um, I think we're all doing mostly better. Next, is that next, man, next Sunday. Next Sunday, bring food. Two Sundays, don't bring food. Uh, I mean, you can bring food. I am certain people will eat it if you bring it. But next Sunday, bring food, uh, and we'll enjoy some, some time of fellowship together. Men, we're going to uh, shoot clay pigeons on June 4th. Sign up sheet is in the back along with the time, uh, where we're going to meet at, and how much it's going to cost you uh, to show up. <clears throat> so uh, please see the sheet back there so that we can kind of plan accordingly. We need you to sign up so we know, uh, or at least can make sure that we have enough shells and clay pigeons for everyone to shoot comfortably uh, and not feel like they wasted their time. So please sign up if you plan on, on joining us. Uh, we're going to have a, a church picnic on July 3rd after the morning service. We'll just have a good time fellowshipping and hanging out together uh, for the afternoon. So please plan on sticking around for that as well. And then long, long-term announcement, but I want you to I want to keep reminded of that Marist Conference on September 17th. Put that on your calendar, uh, and I believe you'll enjoy it. And it'll be a, an encouragement to you and your spouse. Uh, and then also, if you haven't signed up yet, I know I keep saying this, please sign up for the dials graduation party, which is June 4th, so two Saturdays away, two Saturdays, two Saturdays away, uh, so please sign up for that so they can plan for you to be there, uh, that would be an, uh, a blessing and encouragement to them, but let's go ahead and have a word of prayer for our evening offering, Heavenly Father, we do love you, and we're so thankful for your love for us, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather together and to be able to worship you, and Father, uh, to be able to sing songs and praises to your name, uh, Father, to be able to hear your word preached, uh, to be able to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to love on each other, even through giving, Lord, and that's for what we're praying. Lord, we thank you that you allow us to be a part of what you are doing, Lord, and to worship you through those things. And so, Father, as we give, may you take all that is given, use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, would you bless those that give? Lord, may you encourage us in the giving. We pray all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Psalm 228, My Faith is Found a Resting Place. We'll sing uh, three stanzas. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. 
died and that he died for me enough for me that Jesus saves this ends my fear and doubt a sinful soul I come to him he'll never cast me out I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. All right, and then we're going to be learning um, so much to thank him for. I believe I have some helpers coming up for this, so you can make your way up. singing everybody how's everyone doing this evening can you hear me am I on I can't tell so hopefully uh, that's a yes and uh, hopefully you've got so much to thank him for obviously just singing that song uh, what God has done in our in our lives if you're sitting here today if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior I mean how much more you know what more can you thank God for obviously there's many other things but uh, anything you know more than that I mean wow uh, you know uh, if you take your Bibles uh, and open them up to 1st Corinthians chapter 15 uh, that's where we're gonna be at here this evening and I'm gonna put a plug in for the uh, the men's uh, the men's activity coming up, and uh, you say, hey, I, uh, I don't shoot shotguns, you should come anyways, uh, just for the fellowship, just for the fun, uh, you know, maybe it'll be the first time, and, uh, and you'll enjoy it, and maybe you'll get hooked, I don't know, uh, I like shooting guns, and I remember the first time I shot a shotgun, uh, I was in my uh, early 20s, and we had moved to South Dakota, I had been married, I had shotguns before, but not shotguns. If you got that wording down, um, I had shot rifles, there we go, uh, but not shotguns. And I remember uh, uh, moving to South Dakota, and my father-in-law invited me to go pheasant hunting, and uh, I had never gone before, and uh, so I bought a brand new shotgun from Cabela's, and uh, we uh, met up uh, on my wife's grandfather's land, and he said, well, let's, uh, you know, take some practice shots, and uh, so we, he threw out a clay pigeon, and I shot it on the first shot, and I said, well, let's go. And uh, anyways, I enjoyed it ever since. I enjoy shooting clays, and uh, it's fun. 
and uh, I hope you would join us, and uh, uh, I think you would enjoy yourself, uh, whether you shoot or not, um, but uh, I would encourage you to come. You never know what, uh, what you know, getting the fellowship with other men, other Christians, and uh, whether it's something you enjoy doing, whether it's something you've never done, um, and uh, just uh, the, the fellowship with, uh, with other Christians. Like I said, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and basically where we're going to be at uh, is the last uh, uh, few verses of this chapter, but I'm going to start earlier on and kind of basically um, uh, give some of the context or give some of the, the layout, if you will, uh, of uh, where he's getting at uh, towards the end of this chapter. I'm going to open a word of prayer before we jump in, and then we'll start here this evening. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this evening. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house again tonight and just be able to look into your word and, and study it. Lord, I ask that you would just guide my words, guide my thoughts, Lord, that you would just use it for your honor and for your glory. I ask that you'd be with those that are here tonight, that you'd help them to just listen, uh, to be attentive. And Lord, that uh, it would be something that maybe would uh, speak to their hearts, their lives, that they would be able to take something with them uh, here tonight from your word. Uh, give us a great evening tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, we're going to be starting a little bit earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and get, a, uh, if you will, some of the context leading up to the last few verses. We're going to be uh, in 51 through 58. That's where we're going to be at. But we're going to start earlier than that in the, the beginning of this chapter. Uh, I enjoy this, the, the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, I love, uh, obviously Paul didn't write it in chapters and verses, uh, but I love this portion of scripture all the way through this. And uh, we're going to start there in verse 1. He says this, Moreover, brother, and I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which ye also, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This gives us a lot of the foundation of what basically uh, he gets to or refers to later on. If you go through the book of 1 Corinthians, or if you've studied it out, if you know uh, about the book of 1 Corinthians, obviously he writes it to the church there at Corinth. Uh, this church was a carnal church. It was a church that had uh, a sin, uh, uh, unconfessed sin, sin that just kind of had run rampant. And realistically, even going back to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, he talks about uh, uh, the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And if you know uh, about Paul's life, and if you've studied the New Testament, uh, the, Paul's writings, everywhere he went, he preached the gospel. Uh, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, it says that. Uh, he says that in Romans. And uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And hopefully it's something for us that we're not ashamed of that. But he would go around everywhere preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he gives basically the gospel, if you will, in a nutshell, uh, there uh, that Christ w uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for our sins. That's the reason why Jesus came. Uh, the sole purpose of him coming was to die for our sins. And it says there that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And here he basically kind of lays out, if you will, the plan of salvation, just kind of a, a short uh, a couple of verses there or a couple of sentences there about the gospel. If you read through the rest of this chapter, and we're not going to get into necessarily all of it here, but in the next few verses he goes into some of the, uh, uh, the, the witnesses that had seen him after he uh, rose from the dead. In uh, verse uh, uh, 5 it says, and, he, uh, and, and that he was seen of uh, Cephas, then of the twelve. In verse 6, it says, After that he was seed of about 500 brethren at once, of whom uh, the greater part remain unto the, this present, but some are fallen asleep. And he goes into basically some of the witnesses that had seen Jesus after the resurrection. Basically, if you continue on looking at this chapter, it kind of focuses on the resurrection of Christ. And uh, if we get down to verse 14, it says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. And uh, here he basically gets into some of the, uh, the problems of, uh, of uh, if the resurrection was real, if it wasn't, uh, basically some of the witnesses there. And basically that's the, a lot of the focus here over the next uh, majority of this chapter is referring to the resurrection of Christ. 
Let's jump down to verse 51, and like I said, that's where we're going to be at tonight, but I wanted to start off with that because uh, uh, when you take a look at that and then you come to the, 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 to the close of this chapter, these last few verses, the verses that we're going to uh, hit on tonight, uh, reminding ourselves the fact that, uh, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, the resurrection of Christ is the hinge or, or what we believe for salvation, isn't it? Let's take a look at verse 51, and that's where we're going to start here this evening and, uh, uh, and jump into this. He says this in, the, in verses 51 and following. He says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Here, as we start off this evening, we're going to take a look at the victory over death. Here, when, uh, uh, as Paul has gone through this, and again, focusing on the resurrection of Christ, and uh, basically, if Christ hasn't ro uh, rose again, then our faith is vain. We get to this, and he, he basically goes into uh, the last day. Uh, here, he says, behold, I show you mystery. Hey, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Hey, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, there's going to be a day when us as Christians have that, if you will, that final victory over death. We're living in a day and age where we see death often, don't we? But how often is that, is, is death come close to home, if you will? Uh, I don't know about you, sometimes I jump onto like Yahoo or Fox News and you hear about uh, maybe uh, the, the war with Russia and Ukraine, right? And you hear about death, the people that have died. Uh, obviously, in the day and age that we've lived in over the last couple of years, we've heard of uh, the thing called the coronavirus and all the people that have died because of it. And uh, 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 nothing to take away from that. But when you think of death, so often, uh, you know, we hear about it, but does it really touch home? Over the last few months, uh, for my family, it has. Some of you know, or uh, if you don't know, both my parents passed away in the last eight months. Lost my dad in October, suddenly. It wasn't something that was planned. My dad was uh, fairly healthy. Uh, he had a few uh, health issues, but it was nothing, nothing fatal, nothing serious. I remember uh, we, we came here to visit me and my wife, and, and uh, we got here on a Thursday night and, and uh, went over, saw my, my parents. And then on Friday, my mom called me and said my dad had fallen. We uh, uh, immediately went over there. My dad had fallen before, and we went over there to help my dad get up, and he was gone. Just a couple of months ago in, in uh, March, uh, or tail end of February, my mom passed away of cancer. For me, that is the, you know, obviously that's when it comes close to home, death. But when you think about this here, when he says, hey, uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, hey, this corruptible must put on incorruption. Uh, it's amazing to think, though, that my parents, uh, uh, when they did pass, the pain and the suffering of this life was over. Yeah, obviously, I would love to have my parents back, but just to think of when we stand before Christ, all the pain, the suffering, it says there, the corruptible must put on incorruption. Hey, the mortality must put an immortality. Amen. I don't know about you, how many of you have aches and pains? Don't you wish those aches and pains would be gone? I do. Just imagine the day when those will be finally gone. But he says there, hey, uh, uh, in verse 54, he says, hey, death is swallowed up in victory. There is victory over death. We may not necessarily see it in this lifetime in the sense that uh, when it comes down to each and every one of us, we'll all die, right? Unless Jesus Christ comes back before we pass away, we will all die. Everyone that has ever lived has died, right? We can't escape that in this life, but there is victory over death. When you think about death here, he says, hey, death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, you could think of the, the spiritual death 
When Adam and Eve sinned and uh, plunged mankind into spiritual death, if you will, and uh, from there passed on and both physically and spiritually died. I had started out in the beginning of 1 Corinthians for a purpose there, for a reason, because it kind of, again, lays the context. Here, how do we have victory over death, or death is swallowed up in victory without the blood of Jesus Christ? That's how we have the, the, the victory here that he speaks about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. This mortal must put on immortality. Death is swallowed up in victory. Here, when you think about uh, uh, what all will take place, the moment that we are changed into a glorified body and no more have to deal with, uh, with death, no more have to deal with the aches and pains and the, uh, the problems of this life. Man, isn't that something to look forward to? Obviously, for me, I'm not uh, asking to die, but I'm, I, I, you know, when you think about the next life, if you will, death is a new beginning for the Christian when we stand before Christ, when we stay with Him forever. Hey, it's something to look forward to, isn't it? Turn over to 1 Thessalonians real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll be back here in, uh, in 1 Corinthians in just a moment, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 13, he says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. There, he's not talking about uh, just taking of a nap. Uh, uh, Tim, I think it was, that made mention about taking a nap this afternoon. How many of you took a nap? I didn't. He's not talking about that, but he's talking about death here. And he says, hey, uh, them that are asleep, he says, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Have no hope. Obviously here, uh, it's not the way that we really take hope in our day and age in the sense of like uh, here probably, how, how many of you hope it doesn't rain this week or hope it doesn't rain tomorrow? Anyone? Where we came from in southern Utah, we hoped it did rain because we rarely saw rain. And it's not that kind of a hope of like, hey, uh, it may, it may not, uh, I wish it would, but in a, uh, a hope of, uh, of a guarantee of something that will happen. And he says, hey, don't, uh, don't be as those that, don't weep as those that have no hope. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which uh, sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hopefully tonight some of what I say will be an encouragement, but something to look forward to, the fact that we have victory over death. If you are saved today, if you've asked Jesus to be your Savior here today, that's something to look forward to, even though uh, not necessarily going through the, the, the pain or, or the, the things that happen with death, but looking forward to the fact that there is victory over death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Let's take a look at the next couple of verses here, though, tonight. Verses 56 and 57. Uh, First of all, we see uh, the the victory over death. But secondly, here this evening, let's take a look at uh, victory over sin. He says this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Again, similar with the victory over death, the victory over sin. When Jesus Christ uh, saved you, obviously we have that victory over sin. Wouldn't it have been nice, though, if the moment that you got saved, you no longer sinned? I don't know about you. I mean, uh, uh, wouldn't that have been great? You get saved, and the only thing is, it's like maybe, never mind. Uh, uh, Wouldn't that have been great? But obviously, that's not the way it worked. Uh, But we can still have uh, victory over sin, and uh, eventually we will have the ultimate victory over sin, if you will. But he says, hey, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And he says this, the sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin. I think of that word sting, and I think of different animals, if you will, or insects, things that have stingers. Back a few years ago when we first moved to Utah, 
uh, we had just gotten there, and uh, if you've ever moved to a new state, you know, left your job or left, you know, everything and moved to a new state, there's kind of some challenges that go on with that, isn't there? And for us, uh, one of the challenges that we had, we moved to, uh, to Utah, and uh, uh, um, we, we couldn't find a place to, to, to live. And uh, the reason why we couldn't find a place to live was uh, all the places that we were looking at, they had a, you had to have a job for six months. Well, we just moved here. So anyways, uh, we were living in the church at that time, and, and uh, one day I was talking to my wife, and I said, you know, hey, why don't we uh, look at uh, uh, buying an RV? We can park it behind the church, kind of live in that, and, uh, so that we're not living in the church. And, and so on a, uh, we had kind of eyeballed around, and we had found one on a Friday, went and looked at it, bought it, pulled it over to the church, parked it. Saturday, we went and looked at an apartment. The guy uh, allowed us, even without the, uh, the six months of uh, income, if you will, allowed us to rent it. So we never ended up ever living in the RV. That was the whole purpose. Anyways, God had a plan, obviously, with that. And, and uh, we had a lady that started coming to the church that uh, was living in her car. And we got talking to her, and we had made mention about this RV that we had. And we said, hey, uh, if we can find a place to park this RV, um, you know, would you be interested in living in it? And she, yeah, that, that'd be great. So we found a place to park it. And I remember uh, pulling it from the church and over to out there, they have a lot of RV parks where it's, just RVs, not like mobile homes that are stationary, RVs to where you can like park it there for two months, hook it up, go somewhere else. And so I remember backing it in, parking it, and uh, um, I was getting it all hooked up for her, and I remember going over and I, I went to hook up the, 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 the water. And if you know anything about RV parks, there's a valve box, kind of like a, a um, you know, kind of a hose spigot, if you will, on the outside of your house, but it's in a, in a box in the ground. And you have to take off the lid and hook up the water. So I popped off the lid, and I went to reach down in there, and there was a scorpion in there. For me, yeah, cool, yeah, exactly. For me, that, uh, that's kind of my, my reaction was, whoa, I don't want to stick my hand in there, but hey, that's cool. I called everyone over. I said, hey, look, there's a scorpion in here. I had never seen one in the wild, if you will. I'd seen them at the zoo. Uh, uh, you could go down to the zoo and see one. But if you know anything about a, a scorpion, a scorpion has, uh, has that stinger. Another insect, if you will, that does is, you know, bees and wasps. Have you ever been stung before? It's kind of painful, isn't it? I remember back uh, a while ago, uh, me and my brother-in-law were doing some work for my grandfather, and we were tearing some siding off a house, and I remember tearing some siding off, and there was a, a, a beehive in the, in the wall. Being in my early 20s, we got this great idea. We went and bought a bunch of cans of, you know, bee spray killer, and we just walked up and started spraying them. I think I got stung like five or six times. It was great. But you get stung by a bee, and, and it hurts, and it can make an irritation, and, and, and it potentially can cause some problems, can it? Especially if you're allergic. Here he says this. He says, um, there the sting of death is sin. We've seen the verse in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death death. But he says there is sin. Anything we, if you will, think, say, or do that violates God's law. He says there, and the strength of sin is the law. Obviously, for us, we can go back to the Old Testament. We can take a uh, look at the law that God had given, and the law there, basically, uh, the, the strength, if you will, is, uh, is a set of rules, uh, the, the law that is given, and, and how well can we hold to the law? It's impossible. That's why Jesus Christ had to come. I think of there, you know, having no law. The law kind of shows us that we are sinners, right? We uh, live in a day and age where there's, you know, speed limit signs, right? Gideon has got his uh, learner's permit. By the way, if you see my vehicle, he might be driving. I'd stay away. He's a pretty good driver so far. Haven't seen anything too crazy. And uh, we, ha we have speed limit signs. And, and uh, just imagine if we were to just get rid of all the speed limit signs. How many were, would be in favor of that? You're like, no, that would be stupid. People would be doing, you know, whatever speed limit, you know. 
And just imagine going down a road with no speed limit and being pulled over by a police officer and him telling you you went over the speed limit, but there's no law. Can you be condemned or can you uh, break a law that doesn't exist? Obviously for us, God had given us his law and he says there the strength of sin or uh, the thing that condemns us, if you will, is the law of God. But he says this in verse 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us the victory over death. He gave us the victory over sin. Obviously, in the day and age that we live in, we still sin, and sometimes it's hard to live day to day and, and try to, uh, uh, to live right. Even Paul said that. The things that I do, I wish I didn't. The things that I want to do, I don't do. Living a right life, living a life pleasing to God. But he says there, the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. We can again go back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died for our sins, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Here, when you think of sin, sin is conquered, and uh, someday we will go stand before Christ. And the sin that realistically holds us, if you will, the, uh, the, will be no longer. We will have the ultimate victory someday. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't live like we can't have victory today. Paul said, hey, should I continue in sin that grace may abound? And what did he say? God forbid to live a life pleasing to God. Here, let's jump into the last verse of this. We see victory over death. We see victory over sin. But lastly, let's take a look at verse 58. And here, I thought about uh, alliterating this, and then I thought of, uh, of Preston and how, how he hates alliteration. So, if you like alliteration, I have an alliterated point. If you don't like alliteration, I have the other point. So, here, the last one, victory in life or if you don't like alliterated, living abundantly for him. Living abundantly for him. Let's take a look at verse 58, and he says this, therefore, uh, if you've heard different people preach on, uh, with, with the word therefore, if you see that word, what, do you, what is the first thought that comes to your mind, or should be the first thought that comes to your mind? What is it there for? What is it there for? And so here, as he says this, hey, therefore, basically the things that have taken place, and again, if you want uh, the, what he's just kind of uh, reiterated to them here, the victory over death, the victory over sin, the fact that because of what Christ did on the cross and uh, paid for our sins, he says, hey, therefore, he says this, my beloved brethren, my beloved brethren, he says this, be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in him. Here, he gives several words here as he talks about basically uh, uh, living a life for God, if you will. He says this, that ye be steadfast. There, that word steadfast, to be firm or to be fixed, if you will, to be constant, to be fixed. He uses another similar word there, unmovable, to be firm, to not be able to be moved. We can think of different things in our lives that we want to be firm, something that we don't want to move. How many of you, you live in a house and you want the foundation to be movable? You'd be like, that would be stupid. We don't want it to be movable. We want it to be firm. We want it to be stable, if you will, to be firm. And here he says this. He says that because of what Christ has done, he says, hey, that you would be steadfast, that you would be unmovable, and then he also says that you would be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
here this evening. The first two kind of points were just kind of a, uh, uh, more of points of, of remembrance, if you will, to uh, take with you that we do have victory over death, we do have victory over sin, but this last one is a little bit more of a challenge, if you will, that we would always be abounding in the work of the Lord. You say, hey, I'm not called to preach. You don't have to preach to abound in the work of the Lord. I kind of looked around here. I was, uh, I was thinking through what I was going to uh, uh, preach tonight, and, and uh, I had this one, and I had a couple others that I was lo- looking at, and, and I was thinking of this, and I was thinking of all the things that are done around the church and all the different people that help out with those things. I don't know everybody, and I don't know all the things that obviously go on around here. I'm still uh, newer here if you want, but uh, as I was thinking through this, and uh, I was looking at the grass that has to be mowed, and I was thinking of the, the, the building that has to be cleaned. Obviously, for me, I'm coming from uh, a pastoral perspective, if you will. We, I was a pastor for the last five years in southern Utah, and just the things that need to be done. And it's amazing, and it, it's great to see uh, the different people in here that are involved in the work of the Lord. Obviously, not everything around the church, you know, you can be involved in the work of the Lord and not necessarily, you know, be doing something here. But obviously, the things that are done here to help the church function, to help the church continue to move forward, to help the church continue to preach the gospel. Just imagine if people stop doing those things. If you were here yesterday and uh, saw the grass, it was pretty lengthy. In just a week, just imagine if no one, started, no one kept mowing the lawn, where it would go. Or if people stopped cleaning the church. He says there that we would be steadfast, unmovable, that we would be constant, that we would be firm, that we would always be abounding uh, there to, uh, that word uh, always abounding, to have or possess in great quantity or to be in, uh, to increase in the work of the Lord. And he says this, he says this, that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Sometimes we can look at some of the jobs and uh, the things that are taking place and we can say, well, you know, uh, is it really worth it for that, you know, to do that? You know, does anyone ever see the thing that I do? If we're doing the things that we are doing for the work of the Lord, it's not in vain. Man may never see the thing that you do, but God does. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make, uh, sorry, wrong verse, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We will all stand before Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, it says, And every man that striveth for mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The things that you do for Christ are not for necessarily earthly treasures, if you will, but incorruptible, heavenly. Hey, your labor is not in vain. I'm going to close with this statement. It's from a a man that gave his life for the cause of Christ. It's one that many people have used, and I, I know I've heard pastor even use it. And you probably even know, without me even telling you who it was, who said this. But he said this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Here this evening, as we get ready to close, here, victory over death, victory over sin, but here, lastly, living a life, living abundantly for Him, living a life for Him. Are we going to be steadfast? Are we going to be unmovable? It's amazing to me how many people seem to be unmovable, but in years go by, become movable, steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Will you be one of those three or all three of those always abounding?
in the work of the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this evening. I thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for just your word that you've given to us. Lord, to hear this evening that this would just be a challenge to each and every one of us, that we would be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would just give us a great evening tonight. Lord, I ask that you would just be with those that are in here this evening, that are doing the work of the Lord. Lord, that they would realize their labor is not in vain, that the things that they do are for you. I ask, Lord, that you would give us a great night. In Jesus' name, amen.